Yeah. Cool. So how many of these cars have you guys built? Uh, I, we don't disclose, I guess, the, oh, the size okay. of it. But uh, purposely kind of low volume runs. But yeah, 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 enough yeah. that we have fleets distributed between our Ann Arbor and our Los Altos, California, and our Cambridge office. Mm -hmm. And is this Gen this is 3, 4? Gen 4. This okay. is our Platform 4 vehicle, yep. Okay. So this is the, we showed this vehicle at CES 2019. Gotcha. And now we're in a production yeah. run right now. So we, what we showed right there was like the, the first kind of prototype build of that vehicle. And now we're in the production phase of building out a, a small fleet of them. Cool. Did you see that the announcement this morning that Volkswagen said that they had built 200 of the ID3 cars? Did not see that. And, and I was thinking, why should that be a surprise that they've built 200 of these to, I mean, test out their, test to their you know, their, their all new platform? I mean, I've got, it seems like almost maybe a small number. Mm. <laughs> it's, uh, you're not going to say it because somebody's going to hear you live? No, but our time ran out. I didn't know if we were going to formally start something or not. Be a, D the music will come up yeah, and then you'll yeah, know that the yeah. shows are officially yeah. started. I'd be curious, like, I mean, how many cars do you really need? Like, because you need high quality. I think that the idea of just like testing for miles and miles and miles is kind of, uh, if it ever was in, like, uh, I'd be guessing like people are scaling down like the size and up in the simulation and, mm -hmm. um, you know, don't need too many cars, just need the right amount to test very specific things rather than right. lots. Well, I was even thinking about, I mean, just figuring out how to build these things, right? Well, yeah. That, <laughs> you have to build a couple there. I mean, <laughs> whether it works or not, that's, that's irrelevant. <laughs> that's a yeah. yeah. <laughs> whether you can weld the thing together, I mean, that might be important, but <laughs> I could be wrong. Hopefully they got that figured out. <laughs> At some point. Damn the welcome. Watch AutoLine After Hours live at AutoLine.tv every Thursday at 3 p.m. Eastern Time. That's 12 p.m. Pacific. You can subscribe to this podcast for free by searching for AutoLine in iTunes, Stitcher, or YouTube. AutoLine After Hours is brought to you by Bridgestone Tires. Your journey, our passion. Lear a global leader in automotive seating and electrical systems, and by Borg Warner, propulsion solutions that support a clean, energy-efficient world. All right, everybody, welcome to AutoLine After Hours. Gary, how you doing? Doing good. You know, I was thinking on the way over here that we've had so much rain. Remember when there was the Gibbs amphibious vehicle? That oh, was yeah, being I, developed? I remember that. Remember that? Yeah. You know, I was thinking, we're to the point we're all going to need them here. Whatever became of Gibbs? I don't know. Yeah. It was just, Those uh, things were horrifically expensive. They were really cool. They yeah. really worked, mm -hmm. but pricey. Yeah, so it'll stop raining, though, before we'll have to uh, buy one of those, I hope. We got to let everybody know Pete Bigelow from Automotive News is with us, and great having you on the show here, Pete. Thanks, John. Good to be here. Today. One of the reasons we we had you here, of course, is you really cover all this autonomy and mobility and everything for Automotive News. That, that is 100 percent of my focus these days. <laughs> and, yes. and plus, he's really smart. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And our special guest today is Dr. Ryan Eustace, the vice president for Toyota Research Institute. Great having you on the show here, Ryan. Thank you. Thank you for the opportunity. And we got to say, we've got one of your autonomous cars right here in the studio. What's the name? It's a Lexus, but you guys call it something else. Yeah, this is our uh, Generation 4. So our, we call it Platform 4 vehicle. <clears throat> we showed this vehicle <clears throat> excuse me, at CES uh, 2019, so mm -hmm. basically back in January. Um, so this is our latest generation uh, version of the vehicle in terms of our automated driving test fleet that we use within Toyota Research Institute. So, so give, us a, give us a little brief background on what Toyota Research Institute is for the people that are not familiar with Sure, sure, yeah. Uh, so Toyota Research Institute, you know, we just call ourselves TRI for short. Um, we were launched in 2016, and uh, Toyota created, we're, so we're a North America company. Uh, we have offices in Los Altos, California. Um, Silicon Valley. Silicon Valley, exactly. Um, Ann Arbor, Michigan, and Cambridge, Massachusetts. And purposely, these are near um, you know, Stanford, University of Michigan, and MIT. So we're the R&D kind of arm, if you will, in terms of the, you know, this technology doesn't exist today. We are inventing it, right? Um, and so um, Toyota um, recognized, I think, that they wanted to create this new entity that's part of the Toyota group of families, but really to be connected to Silicon Valley, to be tapped into a lot of the AI kind of machine learning, the robotics expertise that really exists here in North America. 
Um, and to really allow this new organization to be like a high-tech company. So allow us to kind of have the type of culture, the nimbleness, um, the infrastructure is actually really important, you know, in terms of like all of our cloud frameworks and stuff. So really let this new organization be born anew to be like a, a startup within Mothership Toyota. You've been at it a while now. This is yet another generation of it. What's your learning curve? How would you assess how you're doing right now? What's the future for autonomous cars look like? Uh, I think the the future is bright. Um, I think the the there's there's kind of two, many different kind of camps that have, have evolved in terms of thinking about this. I think what's really unique about the view that we have within Toyota is we the the take that we have on this technology is that um, the, this kind of dual path approach, where a lot of people are working. A, eliminating the human from the driving, right? And this is what we kind of call our chauffeur systems, where the car is fully capable of the driving task and really the human's the passenger. It's, it's, it's this kind of future, right, where the, either it's going to be in the like, robo-taxis or this idea that I can get in a car and it's going to drive me from where I want to go. Um, but at the same time, what is unique about the view that we have is using the bedrock of the same technology in what we call our Toyota Guardian system. And this is the idea of like, how do we harness and leverage all of the AI, all of the sensing that goes into this, to really think about a car that works with the human to don't leave the road, don't hit things, and don't get hit. And we really think in the near term, a huge kind of potential opportunity to really have this kind of like super ADAS-like system where we can really make an impact on the fatalities that happen today. Does, does, does the driver still drive the vehicle? Exactly. No, they do. So in the Toyota Guardian system, this, it really isn't a super ADAS kind of mindset that this system is running all the time in the background. The human is still the primary driver. You can think about this system as being the ultimate backup, right? So, uh, as, so let me try to characterize it this way. If you look at level two and level three systems that are kind of being brought to the market where these are trying to offer driver convenience and the levels I'm talking about are the SAE levels, you know, zero to five definition. Um, those are trying to, um, basically the car is doing the driving task and the human is playing a supervisory or kind of backup role in those systems. And I would characterize those as human is guarding the AI. And the challenges with those are that, you know, when the car recognizes, oh, I'm getting into a situation I can't handle, I need to hand transfer control back to the human. Well, that's actually a really hard problem to be able to do, not just for the median percentage of people, but you gotta do it for the fifth and like 90th percentile of people too, in terms of their reaction times and their skill set. So taking on that cognitive load of driving and doing that transfer safely is hard. But the far more devilish side of those, uh, or problems of those, is the supervisory role that you're asking the human to play. Because essentially the human is, their job is to monitor these systems, right? Um, and humans, it's no fault of our own, but we'll very quickly kind of build up over trust in these systems based upon a limited experience with them. Um, and so what separates the Toyota Guardian framework is we flip this question around. Instead of imagining human guarding the AI, what happens if AI guarded the human? What would that look like? And so really it's thinking more in this mindset of uh, can we build, uh, you know, working toward an uncrashable Toyota. So if I'm driving a car that has the Guardian system, would I necessarily know unless I got into a bad situation? Well, so we're working on the fundamental technology and the user interface of this also is a very big piece of it. So yes, I mean, so how do we interact with the humans so that they understand? Because um, the, the, with the Toyota kind of guardian technology, it's not that the car actually needs to even act or intervene. It's the fact that the car can be even more very predictive and even through informing and warning the human, you can begin to modify their behavior or let them know. And so they can actually prevent the crash from happening on their own. But you can think of the system as actually uh, amplifying or augmenting the human's uh, control input to the system to ultimately be the ultimate backstop. Ryan, I'm curious how Toyota went down this path with Guardian. Two, three years ago, the rest of the industry was really into this idea of we're going to go from level two, three, four, uh, and, and follow that that kind of you know stair step approach toward autonomy. And this this handoff problem was was almost like a, an aside. And I think in the intervening years here, everybody has realized how complicated it really is to do that handoff. So I'm curious what what it was you identified early on that made you want to to go down a path that's different than the rest of the industry with Guardian. I think. Uh, um 
So we, we've been very consistent, I guess, all along, even with the genesis of TRI back in 2016, like this idea of, of one technology stack that ultimately can support the chauffeur type of application, but at the same time, how do we leverage and use the same technology in the in the Guardian application? And I think it comes from really the leadership that we have at TRI that, you know, if you look at the leadership at, at TRI from Gil Pratt to myself to like John Leonard, um, James Kuffner, who was uh, uh, previously with our organization, now he's with TRI AD in Tokyo. Um, we all are roboticists that have been working in this domain for, you know, decades plus. And so I think that wealth of kind of experience in working with these systems and really having that deep appreciation for where the technology is, but also a deep appreciation for the human factors side of how do you, the interplay of the technology with the human and the machine and that um, the idea that the human can be a backup, it's, it's really challenging because um, humans were not well suited to doing boring, monotonous tasks. So like watching the car drive and expecting that you're going to be looking for when the car is not getting it right it's just a it's, a, it's a really hard task for a human to stay sustained and engaged in. And that really was the foundation for us thinking about this problem differently. What I like about Guardian is, uh, just even a couple of years ago, there was a lot of talk that, oh, in the future, driving is going to be banned because it's going to be proven that the, the autonomous system is safer than a human being. But what you're essentially doing with chauffeur is making a car that a human can't get into an accident with. And to be clear, I mean, yes, I mean, that's the ultimate goal. Um, and when we begin to bring this technology to the market, not, that, we're not saying we're going to be able to prevent all crashes, but we think we can go far beyond ADAS systems today. So, you know, today, um, most every vehicle that we sell in North America comes with our Toyota Safety Sense system as standard equipment. And so this is basically our forward-looking camera with radar. It's our pre-crash system that does automatic emergency braking. Um, we can go far beyond uh, those types of systems, though, I think, and what we're able to do to really think about don't leave the road, don't hit things, don't get hit. And in particular, really understanding the, the human driver as well is a big piece of this. So when we look at our technology stack that goes into automated driving that supports chauffeur, but when we also repurpose it for Guardian, you know, we have essentially this holistic reason about 360, 360 degree sensing around the vehicle. It's our full autonomy perception planning prediction algorithms that are happening to understand the interaction between our, our vehicle and what's happening with the other cars. But then importantly, we have um, like say driver state monitoring cameras inside the cabin, understanding where, the, where is the human looking? Where do we think the human is cognitively aware of? And all of that can kind of come together to make the system actually much more predictive because you know if the human's an attentive and alert well then we're going to give them as much agency as possible in the driving task but if they're drowsy or distracted we see they're starting to get sleepy you know fumbling with the radio it's they may not be attentively aware of something that's empath and we, it's an opportunity for us to be either warning or informing them sooner or ultimately even beginning to assist sooner jolt them in the seat wake up and uh... <laughs> potentially L let me ask you two things you you, you mentioned that TRI hired a whole bunch of you roboticists, okay? For, for many people, they think of a robot, they've seen a picture in a factory of a robot oh, welding, yeah. or they know that they've got a Roomba rolling around in their, in their living room and somebody told them that's a robot, but I'm assuming that's not the kind of roboticists you guys are. And number two, you keep mentioning the word stack. What in layman's terms is a stack? Sure, the stack, it, it really, I mean, we're talking about our software technology or basically our, the, the algorithms and the kind of implementation of that in terms of our, our code base. Um, so and when I say stack, I'm kind of talking about this, the software stack. Okay. Um, and in terms of the roboticist uh, angle, yeah, the really people that have a deep expertise, I would say in field robotics. So my own personal background prior to working in automated driving is I used to work in deep sea robotics. And so basically this idea of like sending robots down to map the ocean floor, you know, kilometers down below the ocean surface. Uh, to do that, that's, I mean, you, need these, you really need to think about engineering these systems fundamentally to be autonomous uh, and to be able to, to understand and recognize the environment using cameras and radar and, you know, or sonar type of technology. So um, I think that, co that holistic kind of integrated perspective of sensing, acting, and reasoning, that's what I really mean by a roboticist is that, all of that kind of comes together to make these be intelligent machines. And you mapped the uh, Titanic, which I did. is probably, uh, so, so did you get to meet James Cameron at any time? Or? No, no, no. <laughs> Curious with, with Guardian, uh, was there a point that you realized that driver monitoring, was that baked in from the beginning of your from plans? The beginning. Very, from the very beginning, yeah. So we see this as being 
uh, an important piece of really this holistic kind of like human and machine working together. And that's really the idea of, of Guardian, is that it's a, it's a blend of the human and the machine. Um, and so with the driver monitoring, um, that's a, a kind of a key piece of us trying to understand what do we think the human is cognitively aware of? Because we can correlate, say, their driver eye gaze with what the system sees and senses uh, externally. We've got uh, a lot of questions here from viewers. Let's get to a couple of them at least. Jeff Taylor from St. Louis, Missouri wants to know, in your opinion, LIDAR, is that going to go long term or will it be replaced by machine vision? Uh, I, I guess I, I, from a system standpoint and thinking about reliability, um, I, I find the opportunity to have complementary sensing modalities is being part of just how you get to a level of redundancy and reliability. So, you know, the, using radar, using ultrasonics, using uh, LIDAR, using machine vision cameras. We, our, our, our approach to this is really to fuse information from all those different inputs. Now, I think in terms of how you go to market and you know, productize some of this technology, um, there's a lot you can do with machine vision today, and it's getting you know, better and better with a lot of the modern kind of deep learning tools that we're applying. Um, but I, I would also say that um, the innovations that are happening in, in LiDAR, there's a lot going on right now, and also the commoditization or you know, kind of making the that cost is the coming, co down, cost is what is coming down as well, right? Yeah. Okay, Aussie to you wants to know, uh, what precautions are you doing for hacking and backdoors, getting into your autonomous system and taking control of the car? Yeah, uh, well, so Toyota Connected is a sister company for us that really, um, they are the division within Toyota that really thinks about having connectivity between the vehicles. Um, yeah, we take it very seriously. Um, we have an entire kind of army within Toyota that thinks about the cybersecurity aspects of this and, and how we defend against that. Uh -huh. as, as Pete alluded to, there are a number of companies that are working on developing various types of autonomous systems. Is, is there going to be a convergence that there'll be one type of system or will there be as many systems out there as there are companies that are building them? Um, it's, that's an interesting question. I mean, I think I think the, there's a convergence in industry that we don't want to compete on safety. So I think in terms of what is, what's the level of performance and kind of levels of standard that we need to kind of meet, I think, as an industry, working together to kind of to define that. Um, right now, yeah, there's a lot of efforts that are going on in terms of different developments that are happening to kind of realize this technology because this is, we're in a space right now where it's not like I, I can just go hire X number of engineers, build this thing, and it's something we can ship as a product. There's unsolved problems in the way that we have to solve. So I think um, you see um, a lot of effort happening right now in different factions within the industry. But you know what, an interesting thought experiment is that uh, maybe at the end of the day, once this is actually in hand, right, and we, it's technology we can field, and it's available, widely kind of available, you know, does this become like the ABS technology of our day, where it's not something we compete upon because we can't compete upon really safety in that way, I think. Since you're talking about safety, one of the metrics that we use to measure safety today is kind of traffic deaths, number of crashes, injuries, and they're all, all reactive or, or lagging statistics. Uh, wondering in an automated vehicle era, is there a better way to go about measuring the safety of, of vehicles? Hmm. or a better statistic. And you're thinking it was from the perspective of like, I mean, the vehicles are, you know, instrumented, they're able to record and sense the environment around it. So like things that like maybe don't get recorded as an accident, but like near miss events would be something that today it doesn't get reported, right? But you would have an opportunity to really quantify and maybe uh, record um, and get a sense of events like that. So, yeah, think about the vehicles themselves as being intelligent sensing platforms might allow us to get just really higher fidelity, if you will, in what these statistics are. Got a few more questions here that are pretty good. Sean asks, uh, do you have to ta tap into the hybrid battery? And he also asks if all this technology was on an electric vehicle, would it impact its range? Oh, yeah, for sure. I mean, it's all in terms of power, power load, right? So. Um, and to be clear, this is, a, this is one of our research test fleet vehicles. So some of the 
um, in terms of the power or kind of watts that we're using on this thing not, aren't necessarily representative of the, of the production system because we're using more um, general purpose kind of compute hardware as well as you know the some of the sensors aren't necessarily optimized yet but yes we do tap into the hybrid battery um, that's one of the advantages of having a hybrid system is that um, we can sustain basically easier the kind of level of power draw that we need from the systems and so if it was a fully EV vehicle yeah it would reduce range Okay, and we also have a phone call here from Clem. It wouldn't be an out of line after hours without a phone call from Clem. Carmen, let's bring that in. Uh, this is Clem Zorowski in Delmont, Pennsylvania. My question is, how many people, private individuals, do you people anticipate buying self-driving cars? I could see it for taxi service and stuff like that, but how many private individuals do you think will buy self-driving cars? Thank you. Thanks. Yeah, it's a good question. Um, so right now, if you look at the, like for instance, the the lidar, the radar, like all the sensing technology, it is um, uh, it's in a realm where to put that on a personally owned vehicle, it's probably it adds a lot of cost to the vehicle that wouldn't make it economically practical for personal ownership. And that is why right now, when you look at full self driving, where a lot of the industry is focused on the Robo taxi or kind of mobility as a service, primarily because one, it's a it's a good business application where you can afford to put say this level of instrumentation on the vehicle. But like a taxi, because it has five percent, you know, over fifty percent kind of utilization, you can re basically return on investment much quicker. Because you know, a personal owned vehicle is only used about five percent of the time, the other ninety five percent of the time is kind of sitting there. Um, but to the earlier question about like say machine vision and some of this type of technology, this is where I guess in the technology that we are developing to support both the chauffeur and guardian applications, we really think about it as a, as a common core of algorithms. And so in the Toyota guardian application, this is geared towards privately owned vehicles. Uh, we do want this to be um, part of our um, technology that we think can have a lot of impact by saving lives. And so to, to distribute it and or get it out at that scale in that fashion, um, this is where um, understanding in the research that we're doing right now, understanding you know, how far can we push machine vision to accomplish some of the perception and prediction tasks that we need to do to support the Guardian application. So Guardian might be a system without LIDAR? Possibly, yeah. So we're really trying to engineer a system that um, on one end of the spectrum, you know, if you give us, uh, give us dense 360 LIDAR and like this car can do the level four kind of driving application and more in the say mobility as a service like setting. But also, uh, if you know, you turn the lidar knob down, potentially down to zero. We've actually trying fundamentally. We're trying to engineer the system to really support that 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 breadth of uh, sensing technology. Is, is vision less expensive than lidar? Yeah. So today, you know, one of the primary reasons why is we all walk around with cell phones in our pocket that have cameras on them. <laughs> Uh, so once you tap into that kind of consumer grade scale with that technology, that's what's really driven down that, you know, you, you can get 12 megapixel cameras now on your cell phone and that's just a thing and it only costs like probably five bucks. Mm -hmm. um, LiDAR is going to be on that path too once it starts to get adopted and kind of used in say ADAS like applications on vehicles and, and uh, self-driving, um, it, will, it will also be driven down in cost. Mm -hmm. Ryan, do you see any room for, while we're talking about sensing, um, like some of these new radar techniques that are coming out or, or infrared, do they have any, any role in, in that, the sensing stack? Yeah, for sure. Um, and uh, that's part of, I guess, the ecosystem that we get to play in uh, with, with TRIs, that we get to work on the latest cutting edge kind of sensors. And in particular, we actually have a uh, Toyota AI Ventures, which is like our investment arm for really trying to incubate and, and invest in some of these early technology startups. So like in the particular with the radar that you're talking about, um, there's some there's startups now are kind of happening in Silicon Valley and elsewhere that are basically giving us kind of three dimensional kind of radar uh, technology. Um, so you get kind of point clouds kind of coming back really from the radar. Uh, the thermal kind of infrared imaging cameras. What's advantageous about them is that when you look at say the modern kind of machine learning algorithms that are being used today, that say they're really good at if you train them to like recognize people or objects in the environment. Uh, part of the challenge with them, with them is, let's say I look at a billboard and, it's in, in, uh, I, I see a picture of John up there, right? It, it will uh, actually recognize him as, as being a person, right? It doesn't really know necessarily the difference. What's cool about a thermal imaging camera is you get this additional signal in terms of what the heat map looks like, right? And that actually becomes a distinguishing feature that you can overlay on top of this to dis then disambiguate from things like that. 
Interesting. Back to some of the, the viewer questions. Jay Siegel says, is the autonomous Lexus going to replace me as an Uber driver? The, so there, I mean, if you look at the efforts that are happening in, in industry, most, a lot of the efforts right now are focused on the mobility as a service application, which is the robo taxi scenario. Um, and the reasoning, the rationale behind it, I think it's the, one, it's the most gentle technology slope in terms of a fully automated driving application with also a, a, a good marriage in terms of like the business application for this, right? So, you know, going back to the question, would I own a, a level four vehicle? Um, the expectation is that, you know, you would want the car to kind of work anywhere, anytime, right? I think in the robo taxi scenario, right, it fits very well with the expectation that, hey, I'm on, I, pick, I want to order uh, a ride on my app, you know, I want to get from point A to point B. In some ways, um, you don't necessarily care if they send a human-driven taxi to you or the robo-taxi, right? As long as you, let's say, you get past your heebie-jeebies of riding an automated driving car. <laughs> but um, the, it fits much better, like, from a business and kind of consumer expectation model, right, that it only works in a certain kind of geographic area. Um, and so I think that's why you see just so much effort going on right now in the industry and in thinking about for the first truly uh, fielded applications of level four, you know, no driver at the wheel, uh, the mobility as a service application is is the right entry point. Geofence, low geo speed. Geofence, yeah, so you can geofence, low speed, weather restricted potentially. Um, and so in particular, if you're like an Uber or a Lyft, you already have a human driven Moz network, right? And so it's really the most gentle technology slope for them in the sense that they, for them, the game is, uh, what fraction of rides can I begin to service, say, with the autonomous car? Because mm -hmm. I can always send the human as a backup, right? It, w one other question here, Barry Rector, and I get this question all the time. Can autonomous cars avoid potholes that would damage tires and wheels? Uh, po possibly, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it's gonna depend on just, a, like, like for humans, are we able to sense that, right? So you're looking for basically this negative depression. Mm -hmm. um, now, presumably, too, you're going to be using a lot of 3D mapping that's going to be updated with other autonomous cars. So maybe the first car hits the pothole and the rest of them don't. No, exactly. That's actually a really good point you bring up is that, yeah, the, does the car itself need to sense it, right? But there's this other, another overlay of technology that, which is like the, the idea of like sharing maps between vehicles. And so, um, yeah, that's the, the, maybe the first car hits it, but then essentially that information gets recorded and annotated in the map. And so... Uh, the vehicle at any given time, the, how they use these high definition maps is that they're correlating their sensor technology in terms of the camera and the radar and the LIDAR data to know very precisely down to like, you know, less than 10 centimeters accuracy at any given time where they are. And so then they can use this as like a spatial database, if you will. Hmm. Well, let me ask you a question about vehicles. Maybe you won't know the answer to this, but okay. So it's not surprising that you have a Lexus LS because, you know, Toyota is your parent, right? But as I think about it, when... Google was doing the self-driving car thing. They started with Lexus RXs. When you see the Apple vehicle, it's another Lexus RX. I mean, is this because researchers like rolling around in Lexuses, or is there something to the vehicles that make it suitable for developing these? So, well, you know, Toyota really leads in the, in the hybrid vehicle space. And so, you know, we really kind of brought this technology um, to market. And so the, yeah, when we look at these vehicles, they are our, our, our hybrid line, right? And so when you're trying to add this instrumentation, this compute to it, hybrid vehicles are just really ideal for that. Because of all the power? Because of the power requirements that you need to draw from it. Um, and then the other thing is too, just you know, highly kind of reliable vehicles. Yeah. From a maintenance standpoint. And they have leather. And I was going to say, yeah. yeah. It's, yeah. I mean, it's not a Highlander or a, or a, a RAV4. Um, with that power requirement in mind, uh, over the long term, I, I always hear like the future is autonomous and electric, but does it maybe make more sense because uh, you want to keep these fleets rolling as much as 24 hours a day as possible? And with an EV, you're going to have to have significant downtime for charging. So as you kind of peer into the future at what a robo taxi fleet looks like, is, is hybrid the right way to go? I would say, you know, maybe initially, um, but as you start to really um, think about the productization, commercialization of this, you start to design um, special purpose hardware. And so in particular, where you, the biggest 
um, power reduction and power draw can come from is on the compute side of things. Um, and so this is where, you know, uh, today, like for instance, NVIDIA has been putting a lot of effort in, in their um, kind of drive PX and their, their basically automotive grade kind of compute technology where it's a, it's a supercomputer, but it's only also running at like say 30 watts. Wow, not much at all. Yeah. That's pretty good. Okay, here, here's another question I get a lot. Uh, this is from Rideshare Supplies, who wants to know, who's responsible for the wreck from an insurance standpoint if the car gets in an accident? This is an open question right now. I mean, this is a part of the transformational shift that's happening. Um, I think the, yeah, who is going to be responsible? Because... And I think speculation don't, is that it, it's going to come back also to the manufacturer. Well, of course, the don't you think that's going to be? I mean, you know, right now it's personal liability, right? I ran the red light, I caused the accident, and I'm in trouble. But if no one's driving, it's going to be product liability, not personal you liability. You know, we're on the red light, though, so that's not a problem. Well, I know, but, you know, th these things are going to be fantastic once you get them on the road. They're not going to be perfect. But it's also why I think... Um, we shouldn't be head rushing into this. That I mean, so I think there is a there, this is a fundamental kind of monumental shift, right? In going from the liability being in a product that we sell to an end consumer, and now having really that liability kind of come back also now to the manufacturer from a product liability standpoint. Potentially, all the suppliers in it too. Suppliers, yeah. But I think this liability question is interesting too. If we loop back to where we started our discussion today about about the complications of a handoff, can you imagine explaining to the uh, the traffic officer who's uh, you know, writing up your accident or to your insurance company? Well, uh, you know, the car was trying to give back control to me and I didn't take it, so the, you know, the manufacturer should be liable. Uh, you know, I think that just opens up an entire can of worms that we're not really prepared to to start dealing with yet. So to Ryan's point that, you know, maybe we don't want to rush into this. I think that that's probably the right way to go. Yeah. Is there is there invention that you guys need to do or have you pretty much invented this stuff and now it's a matter of no. getting it? Uh, I mean, it's, so we're, we're you know, yeah, we're in the, we're the tip of the innovation spear within Toyota in terms of really the, I mean, the technology in terms of the maturity and what's needed to happen, right? There's, there's, there's a lot of unsolved problems still in the way that, uh, need to be tackled and solved to kind of really get it to the level of productization. Um, and this is where, but this is where I think what really influences our thinking within Toyota between like the fully chauffeur system where the car is responsible for driving 100% of the time versus in the Toyota Guardian application using AI to guard the human. Guardian will happen a whole lot faster. We think it will happen a whole lot faster, but also the car is not driving 100% of the time, right? The human, we're, we are expecting and leveraging the fact that the human is the primary driver. We are looking to be the backup to the human, right? This ultimate kind of safety net for you. And so it allows us really to begin to, we think, feel some of this technology sooner in a way that we think can make an impact and save lives. Um, because the, really the, the Achilles heel of, of the chauffeur system is that it does have to drive 100% of the time. Most driving is easy, but the hard stuff's hard. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's a great quote. And with that, we're going to have to wrap up this segment. Really interesting stuff, Ryan. Thank you so much for coming on the show. And obviously, we're going to have to have you back because as you guys improve and improve all this stuff, we're going to want to have updates from you. Awesome. Great. Thank you. Really appreciate the opportunity. Cool. Okay. We're going to take a quick break. Give a thanks to our sponsors. We'll be back talking about some of the news that's going on in this automotive industry. Lear Connexus offers a parental controls application with geofencing that sends notifications regarding driving behavior and location, including curfew alerts, acceleration alerts, and speed alerts. All delivered to a smartphone application that includes vehicle location, driver notifications, and a report card of driving history, including notifications when predefined geographic boundaries are crossed. For more information, visit Lear.com. The world is changing ever-increasing pace. No matter what the mode of transportation, there is always the need for an efficient propulsion system. And that's exactly what Borg Warner has been doing since the earliest days of the automotive industry. 
We create innovative mobility technologies that reduce energy consumption and emissions while improving performance. Our proven track record has made us an industry leader in forward-looking propulsion solutions for combustion, hybrid, and electric vehicles. All right, we're back. And this is the part of the show and Pete may not even know about. Oh, it's worth time for it. Dr. Data. Excellent. Do All you right. know this? Uh, I'm not sure I do. Okay, explain it, Gary. So, so there will be, in this case, a series of numbers, and you get to pick which is the right number. And this, this one's very easy. And in fact, I'm afraid that you're going to know the answer like well, that. Well, I'm afraid and I'm not. And then I'm going to blow the, uh, the setup you gave me earlier about being smart because uh, I'm going to get this wrong <laughs> off the I, I was going to point out that Ryan is probably a little smarter than you. Well, but I was, I was just, you know, I, I, will I, not argue I, with I, that I didn't want to, you know, but I didn't necessarily want to go there. So, Katie, so please bring the first slide up. All right. So, you know, we're talking here about mobility and shared mobility and things like this. And so micro mobility, okay. This is, this is the small stuff. So in 2018, how many rides were taken on micro-mobility well, services? Uh, this could be bicycles, this could oh. be scooters, oh. this could be bicycles or okay. scooters. Bicycles or scooters. Yeah, okay. pretty much. Segways, perhaps. I, so, would, I wouldn't knock the Segway. I, I would include that in micro-mobility. Would you? you know, maybe it's going to make a big comeback here. You we'll think? see. Yeah? I don't know if I think that. Is but that going to be around the time the CB comes back? It's within the, <laughs> <laughs> within the realm of plausibility in both cases. It is, indeed. All right, so, John, what do you think? 42 million, 84 million, 105 million, or 150 million? Well, if you're throwing it. And this is just in the United States. Just okay? the U.S. Just, 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 the US. just talking bicycles and scooters and all that. I got to go with D, 150 million, the biggest number on the list. Are you going to guess now, Gary, or you want me to I created oh. the <laughs> uh, Well, I, I'm torn between C and D right now. And I, really? You know, I. For the sake of setting up an argument here, I'll pick C, so one of us will be right and wrong, but uh, mm -hmm. it, it's definitely on the higher end of this scale. Uh, I, 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 <laughs> so, so, I don't so, like Gary's so, reaction. So, so, I think we're both wrong. I think wrong. you're going to be both wrong. So, so Katie, let's, uh, let's see the real answer. So it's 84 million. That's now, all? Okay but, but, okay, but here's the thing that's astonishing about that. Okay, so, I mean, bring up the third slide. That's twice as many as occurred in 2017. Now that is significant. Exactly. So, so basically what you're seeing is this absolute explosion of this happening. Now, okay, this is basically measuring the micromobility service. This isn't you saying, okay, I'm gonna go home from the studio and I'll go ride my bike. Okay, it isn't that. It's, it's basically that if you're- it's scooter It's an e-scooter. E oh, so, oh, as, so, as a mobility service. As a service, oh, right. Oh, okay, then that's still a pretty impressive it, Yeah, it's, it's, it's very amazing how this is, this is <coughs> taking off. And I mean, I noticed on the uh, front page of this morning's Detroit Free Press talking about how, uh, how uh, Bird and Lime and these other scooter companies are now back in Detroit because, you know, spring has sprung and uh, um, people Alleged. are going in that yeah, well, the weather part, yes, the alleged. But, but Pete, okay, so, so you write about stuff sort of in this space a lot. I mean, do you see transportation changing? I mean, that, that people are, are going to be having different habits in terms of, okay, I'm going to drive so far, then I'll use something for the last mile or? Well, I don't know so much that it will change in terms of I'm going to change my commute as a, you know, you know, single occupant in a vehicle going 20 miles. I don't think that's going to change. But what I do see the, the role of scooters is providing is for either commuters getting off of a, a train somewhere or for people who already live in a city and might think about taking a taxi or a subway. I think that the micromobility portion of this was really going to mushroom in popularity among people looking for those options to go that last mile or two. Mm -hmm. But I don't necessarily think that somebody is going to park their car at a remote location just so they can take a scooter to the last two miles. What do you think? Uh, for the micromobility? Mm -hmm. uh, no, I think it's going to explode. Look at the numbers you just showed. 2x in one year. Mm -hmm. And these little electric scooters are only just getting going. There's m most cities don't have it. You know, it's just a number of cities that have garnered all the headlines that have had it. And uh, I think you're going to see more electric assist bicycle pedal kind of stuff and the like. Uh, 
I think it's going to grow enormously. But to Pete's point, it's going to be sort of an adjunct to doing things. It's not going to be a primary mode of every single day. I go the last mile to work and I come back the last mile. I, I think it's going to be more of, hey, I, I gotta go you know, run a, a little errand here. I'm just gonna jump on a scooter and do it. Mm -hmm. I'll give you a fascinating statistic that I heard the other day. Uh, I was talking to Department of Transportation head in Austin, Texas. They had 700,000 scooter rides during South by Southwest alone this year. And one of the interesting anecdotal observations that he and his staff all had was that traffic around Austin is usually chaos in the midst of the annual festival. And they had a, a, a noted uh, decrease in congestion during the, the height and peak, and it's because, because these scooters were taking off at the same time. You know, and I, I hate to use the word significant yet again in, in the space of three minutes, but that is significant, you know, and that's what's so interesting about this new move to mobility and uh, being able to have traffic calming and, you know, ultimately vehicle-to-vehicle -vehicle communication. You don't need every single vehicle to have that capability to start to notice a significant drop in congestion, which immediately improves fuel efficiency and drops emissions. Absolutely. So in terms of um, timing, tomorrow, Uber is supposed to have its I I IPO. Um, Lyft has had its IPO, and then it reported its uh, first quarter earnings, which were basically its first quarter losses. Um, so billions, not it was or not billions. It was a billion more than bucks, a billion. Right? Yeah. It was yeah. one point one billion dollars, and and then they said, well, but if you take this out and you take this out, and then you slice this and you rice this, it, it it's just millions, you know, just okay. But Waymo also announced that it would have its self-driving vehicles in the greater Phoenix area available on Lyft, I guess sort of the way that, that Aptiv vehicles in Las Vegas are available on Lyft. So, so what's going on here, Pete? I mean, um, well, I mean, th those, the timing of that announcement, I don't think was a coincidence. I think it maybe helped buffet some of the bad news for Lyft that, oh, you know, here's this other, you know, more optimistic picture where Waymo's putting 10 cars in the coming months on the Lyft network in Phoenix. Right. Uh, you know, it's obviously a small scale to start with, but yeah, I think, like you said, uh, like Aptiv working with Lyft in Las Vegas, we're starting to get a glimpse of how these companies are envision a robo-taxi fleet uh, working and they're starting to lay some operational groundwork for that. So, so John Krafcek uh, wrote about when they're making the announcement because nobody says things anymore. They have to write it on Medium or Twitter. Um, quote, this first step in our partnership will allow us to introduce the Waymo driver to Lyft users, enabling them to take what for many will be their first ride in a self-driving vehicle. Is, is this, do you think, a way to make them comfortable? Probably. I mean, I think that you know, starting small and probably on very limited routes with human safety drivers behind the wheel are all going to slowly build consumer acceptance for, for people who are willing to give it a try. I mm -hmm. think there's a certain segment of the population who's just like, nope, never going to do that and uh, don't trust it and that's fine. But I think for the, you know, most of the middle is kind of skeptical about this, but they're going to give it a try. And to Ryan's point earlier, uh, you know, we tend to overtrust things really quickly. So I think once people have a good experience or two, they're going to be like, it, it works great. I mean, we see this with Tesla Autopilot now where people are like, I use this today and it worked fine. I don't know what, you know, all you skeptics are, are griping about because mm -hmm. I saw it work. Yeah. Uh, so I think broadly we'll see that. I was in my backseat eating a hot dog. I mean, it's just... <laughs> <laughs> Once people have a positive experience or two, I think that that's going to go a long way toward toward building acceptance. Do you think this is meaningful at all, or is this just makes you know sounds good for Lyft and, and gives Waymo a little more publicity? Well, you know, everybody's focused on the billion dollar loss. I looked at their top line growth and their gross margin growth, well over a hundred percent, and that's what excites tech investors. And you know, remember. Uh, Amazon lost money for years, and now it's one of the most valuable corporations in the world. In fact, if you want to go back, 
when USA Today came out, it lost money for over a decade before it turned a profit. CNN lost money for years before it turned a profit. But as long as you've got significant growth, and 100% a year of growth is significant, uh, I think Lyft looks a whole lot better than everybody just focusing on that billion dollar loss. Mm -hmm. Well, speaking of a billion, uh, so uh, GM Cruise Automation got $1.5 billion additional investment from SoftBank and T. Rowe Price and a number of other investors. What's going on there, Pete? Well, I think what's going on there is that companies can't do this alone. So I think they're even more actively than before seeking to, to partner up with investors and other companies like Honda is now invested in cruise automation. So they're kind of building these alliances across the tech, automotive, and financial communities to, to put in the billions of dollars that are required to really get a automated vehicle fleet and the technology off the ground. This, this really is like the, a $10 billion project. Mm -hmm. yeah, so, th but one thing I'd add in that is, uh, we know very little about GM Cruise Automation, really. I, I mean, they've put out videos and we've seen the car and all that sort of thing. But to get investors to put in that kind of money, clearly GM Cruise is showing them far more information than they've gone public with. And, you know, there's been uh, a lot of argument as to whether GM Cruise really is going to launch this year, as they've promised. Now they seem to be backing off that statement. Well, this saying, was a taxi service that they were going to have in San Francisco, correct, basically. Correct. Well, and now they're backing off a bit and going, whoa, 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 safety first. You know, as long as it's safe, that's when we're going to launch it. But the timing of this latest round suggests to me whether or not, you know, it's next year, early or whatever, who cares? Investors are, are thinking, in the case of SoftBank and this latest round, which was T. Rowe Price, I think, let it, uh, they're seeing that we're going to make a lot of money on this stuff. And I got to believe GM Cruise is showing them far more information. Yeah, I would have to agree with that because we have not seen much at all from Cruise in a, in a long time. Um, but I think that, you know, we have to be careful or at least acknowledge, like, what is a launch? Like they might put two robo taxis with human safety drivers uh, <laughs> behind point. the wheel, you know, December 31st in San Francisco and be like, we met, we met our 2019 goal. Yeah. But I, you know, is that meaningful? I don't think so. No, we it's not. And they, what they've always promised all along is mass deployment. They haven't talked onesie twosie stuff. Now to your point, maybe they'll do that just to say we met our promise, but their promise ultimately was mass deployment. I think we'll wait and see on what constitutes mass deployment uh, by the end of this year. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. Well, you know, it's, it's interesting, and, and this goes back to uh, a question that we had earlier for Ryan uh, when it was mentioned, uh, the, the Uber driver wondering whether the uh, um, autonomous technology would take over. Um, so yesterday we had the strike uh, um, in several major cities by, by Uber drivers. Um, Toyota is invested in Uber, as are a number of other companies. And, and I just begin to wonder, um, is a company like Uber going to say, hey, we really need to accelerate the autonomous driving capability because we're getting such bad reputation in terms of not paying our drivers very well? Do, do you think there's anything to that? or I think... Kind of maybe at a broad level, but at the same time, I think that, uh, you know, they're much more concerned about getting autonomous technology into the vehicles because they're losing billions of dollars. And theoretically, the profits come once they kick off the, the human drivers and have the automated ones instead. So I think that's where the existential promise of what they're going to do lies, uh, whatever happens in the meantime with the human drivers, which I think they'll still have for a very long time. Um, you know, I, it, to me, if I was in charge of Uber, I'd say it's almost not worth quibbling with, with drivers. I'd give, you know, what's the difference if we lose 1.1 billion or 1.2 billion because we gave them some sort of livable wage or reached some sort of agreement that everybody can pragmatically live with. So this brings up something you guys probably have insights on this. Um, so as you mentioned, John, GM Cruise is talking about launching a robo-taxi fleet. Ford has talked about it's going to be launching some sort of a fleet of something. 
Does it, does it make sense for these companies to start what Uber and Lyft have al already spent billions of dollars on, building out this capability of, you know, having it on our phones that we're able to do this? I mean, I, I just don't understand that. Well, you know, look, everybody's going after the data. That's where the pile of gold is. The pile of gold isn't, you know, giving people rides. It's monetizing the data the car generates as to where it's going and who's in that car and what they're doing. That's where the fortune's going to come from. Uh, my understanding is that Waymo wants exclusivity of that data, and that's why Ford turned down the, data, uh, the, the deal with Waymo. It's why F, you know, FCA didn't care and went along with the deal with Waymo to do these autonomous uh, uh, Pacifica minivans. But now I think FCA has woken up to the fact that, oh my God, we're leaving a lot of money on the table. And so now they've joined BMW's autonomous vehicle consortium development group, even though it's working with Waymo. So I think you're asking a great question though, Gary, uh, because I know why automakers want to get into the business. The real question is, can they succeed? They're good car companies. They're really good car. They know how to make cars. Do they know how to sell services? Right. Do they know how to sell mobility? Not at all. So that's my question. Can they do it? I'm not, I'm not at all uh, confident they can. What do you think, Pete? I'm gonna ask a slightly different question and, and kind of piggyback on that. I think the car companies are really great at selling cars, but the, the ride hailing networks don't buy cars. They're you know, asset light, that is like their business models. They pass the cost of carrying the vehicle on to the, the drivers who are you know, independent contractors on their networks. So in this scenario, who, Uber and Lyft don't wanna buy the cars, Ford and GM don't want to own them either. They want to, to sell them and get them off the book. So who owns the ride hailing vehicle in this in this future? I think I think it's the Uber and Lyft. But they're already losing billions right now. They don't even have to sp imagine how much money they will have to spend right. on a fleet that's equipped with all the technology that Ryan just described. Well, see, but it, it, it seems to me that the reason that they're losing this money is, is basically has nothing to do with the rides. It has to do with their building out the network and the capability of allowing you to pull up your phone right now and having a, an Uber outside there within five minutes or whatever. Yeah, I find it remarkable that they're losing so much money I, just I, while doing that because I, I kind of feel like uh, while that, that is a big undertaking at the same time, it shouldn't be, this shouldn't, to me, this should not be the time where they're losing uh, numbers that start with a B. Right, it, it, it seems odd. Well, maybe, but I think you're right though, Gary, they're buying market share right now and uh, you know, I go back to the Amazon example. Amazon lost a lot of money for a long time because it was out building the infrastructure to be able to deliver packages anywhere, not just in the country, but around the world. Mm -hmm. and, and Uber, Lyft, probably Didi, Ola, and the rest of them are doing the same. All right, we gotta talk about some other stuff besides yeah, mobility. Yeah, yeah, yeah. All right, so, so there was the um, rather Provocative tweet that came out from uh, President Trump yesterday morning when he announced that he had just gotten off the phone with Mary Barra and that uh, the Lordstown plant was was saved, um, that, um, that General Motors is going to be working with a company called Workhorse out of Cincinnati that, that builds electric pickup trucks. And passenger drones. And passenger drones, I'm sorry. Um, so w what's going on here? You guys have any insight on this? Well, you know, I'll jump in first then. You know, look, President Trump ran on a platform that said, I'm bringing manufacturing jobs back to the United States. Ohio is a critical state for him to win. <laughs> and it's in the United States, and, by the way. And it's in, right, and Lordstown's in Ohio. So he's jumping on this going, hey, they're gonna make electric trucks there. But you guys know this plant is ginormous. It is a massive facility. 6.2 million square feet. Yeah, yeah, it's, it's, it can make easily 250,000 vehicles a year. So here's this little, very underfunded, inky dinky little startup that has virtually no customers yet. And they don't need a plant that big. I think it's ludicrous for them to jump in and take on a facility like this. Yeah, I think that uh, this was just another tweet meant to bring on some goodwill for, for President Trump that 
to me, it almost struck General Motors by surprise. Because if you noticed yesterday, several hours went by before they they kind of had a response or a statement to to add to the conversation. So. I wonder if it caught them by surprise to some extent as well. It, it may have if it took them that long to react. But, you know, think about it. Now Mary's got per Trump off her back. Trump, you know, has said, hey, the whole thing's been solved. Everybody's just going to sweep this under the rug until what I think is going to happen. Workhorse is going to come in. Oh, and by the way, the UAW has to approve this deal. So that implies that the union's got to have those jobs. And I, I just don't see this thing working out at all. I'll be surprised if the deal gets done. Well, I mean, even if it does get done, how many jobs are really coming back for a company this well, small from, a couple of from GM to a, max. to a company that had a profit of $21,000 last year? Yeah. Uh, so, you know. Hey, they had a profit. <laughs> well, Better than Uber or Lyft. <laughs> As of March 30th, 2019, the company Workhorse had cash, cash equivalents, and short-term investments of $2.8 million. That don't buy you nothing. That's what I sort of wonder about. nothing. Plus, plus it apparently has fewer than 100 employees. Right yeah, now. look, I wish them all the, uh, you know, the success in the world. They're also trying to get the, the contract for U.S. postal trucks. But so are three or four other big players in there. So, I, like I said, I, I, I wish them success. I'll be stunned if the deal gets done and works. And here's another point. And I, I pointed this out to you in an email earlier, Gary. We've got other startups that have bought GM plants and failed miserably. Remember, uh, Fisker bought the Wilmington, Delaware plant from General Motors. I don't even think they ended up building one car there. And then Elio, the, the elusive, ephemeral Elio that's going to come out with this three-wheel car. Five years ago, they got the GM Shreveport plant in Louisiana. N they haven't built one thing there. Now, there are two other companies with examples of buying uh, old big plants. Tesla got the Numi plant, and it's done quite well there. Rivian bought the old Mitsubishi plant. Let's see what happens with that. So there are, but those are very well-funded companies. I mean, that you know, with billions, not you know, millions in uh, uh, in capital. I thought it was more interesting what what happened um, that that General Motors announced in Oshawa that they're going to be using part of it in building an autonomous test facility. Um, they'll be using part of it to build um, um, repair and spare parts yeah. for, for General Motors vehicles and they'll be doing a stamping operation there. Again, not necessarily taking full advantage of the massive Oshawa complex, but you know, doing something there. Um, Kind of mixing and matching all these different niche needs in one, right. one set location. Right. Yeah. Well, you know, a lot of people don't know this, but automakers, by law, have to maintain repair parts for cars for 10 years after production ends. So that you can still go and get a door, a hood, a fender, that sort of thing, or structural parts on the vehicle. So my guess is that's what they're going to be stamping, is they get the old dies from what was built there, the, I think the Impala, yeah, wasn't that built there? Uh, and XTS, I think. XTS and maybe Lacrosse. I'm not sure exactly, yeah. but uh, my guess is they're just going to be stamping those parts to keep uh, uh, them readily available for mm -hmm. the next 10 years. Yeah, got to come from somewhere. Um, speaking of making stuff, um, so on an earnings call, Mike Manley said that they basically are going to be building, um, or they need to have a mid-sized truck. When do we think we're going to see this in reality? And where is it going to come from? You want to jump in on that, Pete? Well, as quickly as possible, I think, is the answer is as everybody's looking at that mixed size truck market and Ford seems to be having success bringing the, the Ranger back and Chevy with the Colorado. Uh, as to the where, I'll leave that to John. Well, you know, look, they, they've got a mid sized truck. It's called the Jeep Gladiator. And uh, so now you've had Gladiator come in, Ranger come in, uh, Colorado Canyon, Tacoma's been there. Uh, I don't know where you want to classify the ridge line from Honda. Hyundai wants to get into the segment. Volkswagen's talking about getting into the segment. Who do you really want to go into it? Unless, and that was very interesting, if they can find a low cost source to make it. 
So that tells me uh, Mexico would probably be the only realistic choice because I do think Trump's going to go through with these tariffs. Uh, you know, I, they're not going to come in from China, I guess is what I'm saying. You know, Thailand is actually the second biggest truck producing country in the world. Uh, you know, would it come from there? Probably not if the tariffs go through. The only possibility I see is Mexico. Or, you know, uh, Fiat's got this inky-dinky little truck that's a whole size smaller. So if I were FCA, and I'm looking at the, the so-called midsize of all the trucks we were just talking about, maybe I want to slot in something that's even smaller where nobody's playing yet. He said, he said a metric ton midsize Okay, well, no, that, that's not the little Fiat thing. Right. No. That's... Uh, that's like the old Dakota yeah. with heavy-duty springs to be a one-ton capability. So, as we're getting near the end here, um, so another executive vice president left Nissan. Um, this is uh, Danielle Schlashi went to, he's going to become the CEO of Brembo. I mean, we, we seem to be seeing all of these people spinning out. I mean, um, um, Christian Munier just bolted from infinity to go run Jeep. Yeah. Look, it's anybody who had any connection to Carlos going knows my career's done here at this company. If, if you smiled and waved and said, hello, Carlos, good morning, you're toast. <laughs> Even if you only did it one time in your career. Any, anybody with any connection to Gowen has got to bail the company at an executive level. Okay, so, so my question to you then is what happens to Nissan as a company if they're losing so many top-level people? Well, people are replaceable. They'll go out and recruit others. It'll open up the door for other possibilities. It's not good to have. I'm just saying it's not the end of the world for the company. It's, it'll hurt them. But, you know, I, as I keep saying, this is an industry that knows how to chew its way through disaster. Well, I mean, because, I, I, I mean, as, as, as you well know that whenever somebody leaves a certain company that begins with T that's located in California, we suddenly get these frantic emails explaining, oh, my God, you know, they're going to they're going to be closing up. This person has left. This person has left. I mean, <coughs> under the circumstances of what's going on over at Nissan, I mean, that's nothing. Well, remember, there's a, a whole industry of Tesla shorts out there who pounce on every little bit of even slightly negative information. Nissan and the rest of the industry, by and large, doesn't face that kind of an issue. So we just sort of take these personnel moves with interest, but, you know, we don't make it headline news. Yeah, I don't think it's a make or break the company sort of exodus mm -hmm. like like Tesla might be perceived to be, even though I, I don't necessarily think that's the case for Tesla either. I think there's just heightened interest, <coughs> um, whereas Nissan, I think, you know, maybe dinged a little bit in the short term, but I don't think it makes a too big of a ripple over the long term. Mm -hmm. so, so going full circle here, you know, <coughs> so we, we talked about Toyota. We talked about General Motors Cruise. We mentioned Ford. They've got Argo AI that they're doing work with them. We mentioned that FCA is, is doing something with BMW and um, have been selling Pacificas to Waymo. Um, Honda, as you mentioned, is invested in GM Cruise. Um, What's Nissan doing? That is a great question. Uh, they, they are a big believer in this uh, this level three sort of system that we talked about, where uh, where there'd be what we call conditional automation, where the car is in control for a certain period of time and it, it may hand control back to the human driver. Uh, so I think that they are on that gradual path toward a level four vehicle. Uh, right now, they have a system called ProPilot, which would be like their their level two system where the human driver is always in control, but they have, you know, things like lane centering, lane keeping, uh, adaptive cruise control kind of all coupled together. Uh, so uh, I don't know where any of the companies really get to a, you know, deployment of uh, cars that drive by themselves from A to all the way from A to B over the entire journey. I think that's far away for everybody. But I think Nissan has really kind of, at least in the short term, put its marbles in the, in the conditional automation systems. So compared to the other guys, they're not as aggressive or? Yeah, I mean, I, I don't think you hear 
them making announcements about pursuing level four technology like an Argo AI Ford or GM Cruise or Waymo. I think they're they're much more on a you know longer runway toward that. Even even though like a level three problem, you know, with a human involved is very. I almost don't want to say that it's the same continuous path because that's a very different problem than than building a car from scratch essentially that never involves a human behind the wheel. Toyota is the only Japanese company that's taking autonomous vehicle technology seriously. The rest of them just are not putting in that kind of effort. And even Toyota, I would say, would not be one of the more, they're not one of the aggressive ones out there. No, in fact, Akio Toyota, I, I would say five years ago, poo-pooed the whole technology. They've also sort of poo-pooed electric cars too, by the way. So they're, you know, going their own way. But uh, I think it was not too long after Akio said that where he sort of woke up and went, holy moly, look at everybody else jumping in. If this works, we're toast. And it, what I found so interesting, you know, they started TRI here, which is really a, it's an AI research operation. Three different locations, all in the United States. I find that fascinating. None of this is being done in Japan. Although he, he did mention that uh, James Kuffner has gone over to uh, TRI AD, which I believe stands for automated driving or autonomous driving. I'd have to go back and look. I know that. But they're doing something over there. TRI AD is kind of this middle ground company where uh, the research from TRI proper is taken, uh, and as they move it toward a production ready vehicle, TRI AD is kind of the. Uh, you know, a middle, a middleman for, for making that happen. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah, it's, 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 it, what they're doing is, is, is just fascinating. I mean, when, when, you know, as you say, that Akio just suddenly said, okay, we got to do something. And uh, what was it, $5 billion that they invested, like, from the get-go? I think that sounds about right. And, uh, you know, hired, uh, you know, Gil Pratt, who runs the organization, was what, he was at DARPA or, um, you know, I mean, and, just like this entire dream team of, of PhDs from, from places like, you know, uh, um, um, University of Michigan and MIT and Stanford and just... Well, you know, they just reported a profit of $17 billion. Which was so, down from 22. It, it was down from 22, right? Like, but, you know, so you need $5 billion they for... Uh, night, right? I mean, it's just... Yeah, you need $5 billion for AVs. Yeah, there, there's the money right there. If you need more, come back. Mm -hmm. So... You know what's interesting to me about our, our whole discussion with Ryan earlier and, and some of the other things we've talked about is we spent a whole lot of time on Guardian and like driver assist systems uh, while, while the true fully self-driving stuff, like we didn't scratch on that nearly as much. And I think that's indicative of where the industry is at right now, where everybody realizes that the, the true full self-driving level four car in a meaningful deployment is a long way away. So for now, how do we take the technology behind that right. and apply it right now in ways that we can make money and save lives? Yep, I totally agree. And we should probably wrap up. Should. But hey, Pete, thanks so much for coming on the show. Oh, thank you for really the invitation. Good. Great to be here. Gary, always good to see you. Good. And always good to see all of you. Thank you for watching. Auto Line After Hours is brought to you by Bridgestone Tires, your journey, our passion. Lear, a global leader in automotive seating and electrical systems. And by Borg Warner, propulsion solutions that support a clean, energy efficient world. Visit our website, Autoline.tv, where you can watch us live Thursday afternoons. Get your daily fix with AutoLine Daily and in-depth analysis and interviews with AutoLine This Week. There's all that and much more at AutoLine.tv. We're still live here, and I know we've got some people still watching. Let's ask a couple of the questions that we didn't get time to, to get to. David Crockett wants to know, can autonomy be accomplished with a manual transmission? I would say, by definition, it's no longer autonomous. <laughs> yeah, I'd have to agree with that, that uh, to be automated, an automated vehicle making uh, decisions and control inputs would, would, by definition, be impossible in a manual transmission vehicle. In fact, I don't even think you can have adaptive cruise control with a manual transmission. Because as the car s slows all the way down, it, the engine's going to stall. You could put an actuator that would shift the car.
But then doesn't that mean it's not manual anymore? I mean, it could be if a machine is doing it, it's by definition automated it. it oh, let's interesting just, question. Let's just answer the question. Machine no, will, it's not going to happen. Machine you will transmission. <laughs> okay, Brent McKinney says, who's going to make an electric truck with 15 to 25% less efficiency than Tesla? Not sure I understand the question. Less efficiency or? Yeah, or maybe more efficiency. Uh, Doesn't Workhorse basically have a 75 to 85 mile range? I think that's what their trucks have, which uh, doesn't strike me as being particularly efficient. So, Doug French says, with the Rivian GM deal falling apart, wouldn't GM Workhorse in Lordstown make a uh, make sense. See, as which is what I thought until you set me straight on this, John. So why don't you explain why this ain't happening? Oh, it's not happening. I mean, it, it, GM is not going to partner with Workhorse. They're just not going to do it. I, they made it very clear. This is not their electric truck. They've got their own version of the, uh, uh, they're going to have a Silverado stuffed with batteries. And then they're working on a totally clean new architecture that's going to spawn five different variants off it, including a truck. What do you think, Pete? Yeah, I, I can't really see or envision GM working with, uh, you know, a company that's on the size and scale of Workhorse either. I think that's, that's probably a non-starter. Mm -hmm. And uh, the other one, uh, Barry Rector from Indy was also acting, asking about Workhorse. You know, what do we know about it? We don't know a whole lot. I do know they make passenger drones because they exhibited one at the Detroit Auto Show in January. And uh, I know they've been working on this electric stuff, but uh, so are so many other companies. Well, that's why, you know, I, I feel like there's so many others that are much further along with right. more funding. Right. That why would you go with the guy who's still at square, right. small company at square one? Yeah. No, I, I think, like I said earlier, that uh, t Trump and GM love Workhorse because it's essentially put the whole Lordstown issue to bed as far as they're concerned. Maybe not for the people in Lordstown or that worked at the plant, but as far as Trump and GM are done, are concerned, it's bing, bang, boom, then no more. And it's the union's fault if it doesn't ultimately happen. <laughs> <laughs> right. right. They can bring right. somebody else. Right. I just get oh, interesting. Our work uh, in a regular viewer says the new Corolla has adaptive cruise control with a manual. Hmm. Very interesting. I have, you know, we all test drive a whole bunch of cars. I have never test driven a car with a manual with uh, adaptive cruise. I want to go get the Corolla and yeah, yeah, see how that out. works out. Right. Mm -hmm. <laughs> have it stall on you. Oops. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Good. Let's get. All right. Thank you, guys. Yeah. Thank you. No, it was fun. Yeah.